would like to introduce Norman Lloyd. And Norman Lloyd uh, was born in Jersey City in New Jersey 97 years ago. And he is still very much involved in Hollywood. Both, uh, he was a, uh, has a prolific career, both as a producer and director. And it spans more than five decades. And uh, there's many uh, um, parts that I think that we've seen him play, and I know that I have. And I'm, I don't want to steal the thunder. I know uh, Mr. Medved is going to go into it a little bit further. Uh, but for everything from major Hitchcock movies and, and in reading about him knowing Hitch, uh, I, th I know he's got some good stories to tell us, and I don't want to. Um, uh, belabor and take any more time because I know we want to hear from you and if you'd come forward I just want to thank you so much for coming here this evening gracing us with your presence <laughs> he's been in the business for 80 years this is his 80 years in business in the Hollywood industry and uh, he's telling me this looks a little bit different than last time when you were here <laughs> so. um, Norman thank you so much for coming and joining us here um, a number of people heard Norman on the radio the other night talking with Jim Shada on KUSC. And uh, one of the reasons that Norman is here is because of a director who um, should be on the lips of everyone, just like Alfred Hitchcock, who you know people should know, but he's sometimes forgotten, and his name is Lewis Milestone. He was a really a man's man, and I want uh, Norman to talk a little bit about him. One quick story I was going to give is that, you know, um, it used to be in the days of Prohibition, it was hard to get alcohol in Los Angeles, so sometimes people went down to the port, down to San Pedro. So he shot a film there in the early 30s called The Captain Hates the Sea. And the story goes, and Norman, you hadn't heard this before, right? But uh, that it was with a lot of hard-drinking actors like John Gilbert and Walter Connolly and other guys who really know how, how to have fun, and so to speak, back then. And uh, they kept uh, blowing the takes, apparently, and they were just like late to the set all the time because they were drinking so much. And so uh, the front office at the studio cabled this director, Lewis Milestone, was, you know, he was working with an all-man cast pretty much, and said, you gotta hurry up because the cost is staggering. And Milestone apparently sent back a note saying, so is the cast, because <laughs> they were staggering all the time. So at any rate, tell us, a, so Milestone shot four different movies in this area. Now when I say this area, we're not talking about Oak Park specifically. We're talking about, um, this Las Virginis Valley and some of the Conejo Valley. It includes Westlake Village, it includes Agora, it includes Oak Park, a little bit of North Ranch. The four films um, are Of Mice and Men, A Walk in the Sun, The Red Pony, and Pork Chop Hill with Gregory Peck. And Norman worked with uh, Milestone on two of those films as um, associate to the producer on The Red Pony, and you starred in A Walk in the Sun. So maybe just tell us a little bit about, uh, you said that this was a lucky ranch for Milestone. He returned again and again. Tell us a little bit about that and, and why he came out here. Well, first may I say it is unrecognizable. <laughs> Have all of you had the experience of coming back to a place that you knew very well and it is unrecognizable? So I feel I have been displaced. <laughs> However, I'll try to rec recollect the year, which was 1944, that I first came here to do a walk in the sun with Milestone, who considered it his lucky location, because as was mentioned, he used it three times. Now, at that time, there was nothing here, just field and hills. And so when we did a walk in the sun, it doubled for Italy. <laughs> and uh, when he did the Red Pony, it remained California. Uh, he did Of Mice and Men here, the first production of it with uh, Burgess Meredith and uh, Lon Chaney Jr. It was. California. I don't know what it was for Pork Chuck Hill. It would have been the Korea. So it had many faces, so to speak. Um, the great thing about it is, at that time, was it the open areas, the hills. It was a wonderful location to shoot. And uh, we had a great time doing a walk in the sun here. 
And when we did the Red Pony, we had a couple of problems. The pony, beautiful little pony, if he was left alone for a moment in the field, would decide it was time to escape to his freedom. <laughs> and he would take off into the hills. So this large production with, with Myrna Loy and Robert Mitchum and Lewis Calhoun would have to stop. And <laughs> various grips and people in charge of the the horses and the cattle and all had to mount steeds and chase this pony through the hills. And he was fast and very elusive. And he never gave up. They caught him, they'd bring him back. And the first opportunity he got again, he took off. Now he was an amazing personality, this pony, because one of the troubles we had with the picture, and I always thought, it was why we never fully succeeded in extracting all the richness of Steinbeck's story. As you may know, the story is about a little boy, about 10, who has this red pony. And his relationship with Billy Buck, played by Robert Mitchum, whom we will discuss in a moment. But about the pony and this boy, and this is a result that no director could foresee. The pony took a dislike to this boy <laughs> who is in the story in love with this pony. <laughs> this presented a problem in doing scenes because the pony was a very good actor and if you can imagine two actors, in this case a pony and a boy, the boy loved the pony, but the pony would have nothing to do with him, and finally took to putting his front foot on the boy's foot. <laughs> and very often, Milestone would say to the boy, now you go over and sit on that chair, and the boy would say, I stopped to cry. He said, I can't move. <laughs> Why can't you move? As a milestone. Because the pony is stepping on my foot. <laughs> and do you know the pony? This was deliberate. He did it every take. We had a terrible time pushing that pony off the boy. <laughs> this combined with the fact that so uh, we managed to finish the picture. But we never quite got the relationship of the boy and the pony that Steinbeck got in the written story. <laughs> then there was the, uh, I won't call it a problem because he was never a problem. There was the interesting Robert Mitchum. <laughs> now Lou Calhoun was a great figure. He was a marvelous King Lear years later, and he was a legend on Broadway. And he came out to play the grandpa in this picture. Now, Calhoun was known for giving uh, nicknames to people. Uh, he named Lazar, who was an agent, Swifty. He named his wife, who was named Marion, there was a shortstop on the St. Louis Cards named Slats Marion, so he called her Slats. And uh, he named uh, Martin Gable, who wore silk shirts, Silky. So with this background, he nicknamed Mitchum Old Crow, <laughs> after the bourbon that Mitchum drank. And Mitchum adored him. <laughs> Mitchum, who is a pretty tough guy and uh, nothing phased him very much, but he would, he looked up to Calhoun. He th thought Calhoun was great. And Calhoun 
when Mitchum would come in after, say, a night of Old Crow, and maybe go up on his lines in a scene, Calhoun would turn to Milestone and say, when do we can get some actors in here? Uh, this, Mitchum thought, was a compliment. <laughs> and so we had a, a very rich cast on this, doing it out here in these fields. And uh, some, of the, some of the picture worked very well indeed. Well, Bo Bridges had been, uh, was the son of Lloyd Bridges, who was in The Walk in the Sun. And his boy was about seven, I think, and just, uh, there were children in the picture, and Bo Bridges was recommended by his father. His father said to Milestone, do you want the boy to be in it? And so that's how we got the picture. But uh, this location, uh, in the walk in the sun was very interesting because um, it was Italy. And a recurring line in that picture as we walked through this squad walking through to capture a farmhouse. I had a line in the picture saying we'll fight the next war in Tibet. I hope it was not predictable. <laughs> and uh, Milestone was an amazing director. He was, you know, Howard Hughes, when Howard Hughes first went into producing pictures, his first pictures were with Milestone as the director. Uh, the first Academy Awards were for comedy and drama. That is to say, today, it's for one picture, but then it was for two. And Milestone won the first Academy Award at that time for a picture called Two Arabian Nights with Edmund Lowe and uh, William Stage Boy, that's distinguished from Hopalong Cassidy. Uh, he, uh, he then directed for use the front page, and he he had greatness as a director. Of course, he directed a genuine masterpiece. I think in Hollywood history, it's a genuine masterpiece, All Quiet in the Western Front. And uh, he then, as I said, he then directed the front page for Howard Hughes. Uh, he was an amazing man. He had come over from Europe, from Bessarabia, I think, and uh, he learned to speak English in front of a cigar store at 42nd Street, uh, 47th Street and Broadway. So his speech was quite colorful. And uh, he, he was a rebel. He believed his picture would be as good as he could resist the front office. He came out here from New York and he came out with going to work in a cutting room at $15 a week. He had some money so he could take the job, but the guy who had the cutting room only could take out $30 a week. But Millie, being raised in New York, arrived in a taxi. And the guy said to him, you cannot come to work in a taxi. I can't afford it. You cannot come to work. And so Millie quit. And he went to work for Thomas Ince, one of the great pioneers of the history of the motion picture business. And uh, Millie liked to come to work at 11 o'clock in the morning. And he came in one day, and Ince decreed that they had to come in at 9. And he came to work at 11 o'clock one morning, and the guard on the gate said, you can't come in without punching the clock. Millie said, I don't punch the clock. He said, well, you've got to punch the clock, or you can't get on. Millie said, where's the clock? He said, over there. He went over to it and he smashed it. <laughs> he says, tell Ince, I punched the clock. <laughs> now at that time, there was no such thing as coded film. Film was coded on the side so that the editors and other people who worked with the film could know where it went in the picture. At that time, coding had not been created. 
So only the editor knew when he cut a sequence, marked it with a chalk pencil, marked it with a chalk pencil, and then put a rubber band about it and threw it in the can. Only the editor, known in those days as the cutter, knew what that film was. So Ince, having fired Milestone, who had this can full of film, then said he, he Ince, was going to cut it, and he couldn't find, he didn't know where to find a close-up in the thing, or anything. So he said, find Milestone. They found him in a bar across the street, and they brought him back, because he's the only one who knew the film. But this kind of rebellion uh, followed Millie all through his life. And you know, when we made the picture out here, the producer was Samuel Bronston, who dropped out of the picture, so to speak, the first week because he ran out of money. And Milestone came up with some money from Las Vegas, which had a rather dark background. So that when we started the picture, which was about a platoon of young soldiers, and I was the lead on the platoon, the scout. All young fellas, some of whom had served in the Marines at Guadalcanal and all this kind of thing. When this new money came in, I looked back one day at the platoon and they were all older and rather sort of heavy beards and looked to me to be around 30 years old, where the platoon had looked to be about 20. These were new men who came in to protect the new money, and immediately started on here, in one of these fields here, the favorite traveling crap game in Hollywood. <laughs> these guys, every morning, uh, was a little chilly, They'd build a little fire, and the dice would roll. And Milestone liked to get in the game. And I remember distinctly one day he was in there, and he was out 20 bucks when 20 bucks meant something. And uh, the assistant director came up and said, we're ready for the shot, Mr. Milestone. And he said, get out of here. He was behind 20 bucks. He said, get out of here. Come back when I'm ready. And he would not start shooting till he got square again with that 20 bucks. So, so this is the history of this beautiful canyon. It, it, and what? Well, yes, you know, there was no freeway. And we actually lived in the Malibu, is it called the country club? Malibu, Malibu Lake Mountain Club. Malibu Lake Mountain Club. We actually lived there. Because, you see, there was no freeway. There was a road up to San Francisco and another road down. And uh, early on in the shooting, there was a terrific rainstorm and the equipment got stuck in the mud. And we couldn't find anything to get us out. And what do you know? Nearby, there was a traveling circus, a small circus. And they had two elephants. And we got the elephants, and they got us out of the mud. They dragged us out. So you see, it was very adventurous shooting out here. And living at the Malibu uh, Lake Club uh, was OK for a limited time. But then the fellows, since it was an all-male cast, they got restless uh, for female companionship. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there were a lot of vacancies at the Malibu Lake Club because the guys went back into town even though it was a very tough ride. Tell us about so you shot here in the winter for a, a walk in the sun, which is kind of ironic because it's supposed to be sunny Italy the whole time. But for Red Pony, I heard it was like 100 degrees here. It was, it was hot as heck, right? Yeah. Tell, tell us about, so tell us about with Red Pony, what, um, how did you get a hold of Steinbeck and maybe if you have any stories about Aaron Copeland you told me that Copeland, Aaron Copeland, for those who probably listen to KOSC, you guys know who he is, but for those who don't, probably the greatest American composer that there is and one of the great film composers of all time. But uh, tell us about uh, Steinbeck and Copeland and the, the association on those two films. 
Well, actually, Steinbeck wrote the script, and we did go to New York and uh, polish the script with him. But uh, as far as Copeland was concerned, he never came out here to this location. But he looked at all the film that was shot here and got a sense of the ranch, and he knew this place from Of, of Mice and Men. Now, the interesting thing about A Mice and Men and Copeland's score is this. It was about the first time that a composer, with the start of the picture, before the main title even came on, you find the two men running. They're trying to escape from Lenny of Mice and Men had killed something. And they run, and you pick them up running right with the first shot. And Copeland's music started with that shot. And his music developed with the story right from the first shot. And that was very unusual at that time. I think subsequently it was used in many pictures. But at that time, this was a very unusual facet of Copeland's score. Also, there is animation in the picture. And uh, the guys who were going to do the animation, John Hubley, who was a genius who had left Disney to start his own company with a couple of other fellas. John Hubley and these fellas were going to be paid by the accepted foot of what they animated. They had to try five times, the poor guys, had to, before it was accepted and they could get paid. But it was Copeland's music that has lived and is played by orchestras, symphony orchestras of this day, with his other scores from uh, Quiet City, a play in which I appeared, and uh, from Our Town, and the heiress, known as Washington Square. So Copeland knew this area from watching films. And uh, he, I think he captured it beautifully in this lovely score of The Red Pony, which actually has more staying power than the picture. Um, I'm gonna give you about uh, three or four more questions, but before I do, How's the sun on you? Do you want to move over here? We have more shade. Sun. I'm an actor who loves... I walk in the, on the moonlight night with the moon. You see, I get the sun. Um, and then I'm going to say, if, I'm sure people here have questions, so think of questions. I have three more, and then I would love you to... I know we have a question here about Orson Welles, which we'll get to in a moment. But so the, the film previewed, you said, in Santa Barbara. Is that right? Yes. You want to tell us about how that preview went? and. Was that common that they felt Santa Barbara was far enough away from Hollywood that they could get the real people to uh, tell us what they thought of a movie? Or? Yeah, we get it away from the motion picture colony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there used to be a theater down there on uh, Sepulveda, the Loyola Theater near the airport. You see it now, it's a market. Is that what happens to the motion picture business? Eventually it becomes a market. Uh, anyway, uh, they used to go to this theater on the old, uh, on Sepulveda, the old La Jolla. It's now a office building. But Santa Barbara became a favorite place. So get it out of town, you don't get all these opinions uh, that tell you how to recut the picture. I always thought growing up, watching your performances in movies, I assumed you were English. I didn't know it was a mid-Atlantic accent. But uh, tell us about uh, your love for the California sunshine and the love for playing tennis. And, and do you miss Broadway? As you I love the way you pronounce Broadway. It's Broadway is like the old-fashioned way. But tell us about, about New York versus California. Well, there's nothing to tell now. <laughs> because there's California, but I... Broadway is its own thing, but it has no resemblance to when I started back in 1932 is my 80th year in the business and I have no, I, 
Thank you. I have no nostalgia. I have no desire to go back. Uh, I don't find Broadway interesting. This is a very subjective opinion, very personal opinion, but it seemed like it was a much more flourishing place back in the 30s and 40s, and certainly in the 20s, when I was a kid, the first show I ever saw was in 1923, it was Eddie Cantor and Kid Boots. <laughs> but we had big musical stars in those days. You had Cantor, you had Al Jolson, Chaplin once told me that he thought that Al Jolson was the most charismatic figure he ever saw on a stage, working alone. And uh, you had these great stars in those days, Cornell, uh, Hayes, Ina Claire, etc. We don't have that now. I know there may be people who will take issue with me, but that's how I feel. So I can't talk about a comparison. I went back and forth for a while and came out here, loved California, loved the weather and tennis and the way of life instead of um, wandering around the pavements of Broadway. And I understand you're still playing tennis to this day. And maybe tell us about at 97, how's your, your swing and all that stuff? I'm great. <laughs> Yes, I, I played yesterday. I have people I played with. They're all very young. Uh, I, I don't resort to cheating because of my age, although I know those who do. <laughs> but uh, California, one was lucky to be here at a time when there were some giants. Chaplin, Hitchcock, Renoir, whose cap I'm wearing. Uh, Wells I worked with in the theater. I didn't work with Orson out here, although I originally came out here with Orson and as a harbinger of what was going to happen to Austin, even though this was before Citizen Kane, we came out to make a picture called The Heart of Darkness. And we were here for uh, six weeks and the studio decided they didn't want to make it. But this was a harbinger of the trouble he was going to get into. But not before he got into that trouble, he made Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons. And he was a great talent who, well, I, I was being interviewed one day by a well-known ex executive at a studio, at a major studio, and he looked at my dossier, so to speak, and he saw that I'd worked with Orson Welles, and he said, you work with Welles, eh? A little rich for my blood. And I was out the door in about five minutes. So uh, they had a feeling against Dawson here, I always felt, but he's one of our great talents, no question. And did I mention all those directors that we talked about? Yes, yes. And of course, with the newer generation, although he's now part of the older generation, there was Scorsese and uh, Peter Weir, whom I have great admiration for, and for Scorsese, Scorsese yes. Yeah, anybody saw a Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams? This is the stern headmaster who fires Robin Williams, and all the students get up and say, oh, Capitan, and recite that poem and tell you off. And you, you sure look like a mean guy. I had to. Um, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned Steinbeck. Uh, do you have any stories or stories about Steinbeck or a few words about the kind of person he was? 
What, what kind of person was Steinbeck? Did you, you met with him? I'm sorry, I can't give you much about him. We met about two or three times in New York. A milestone and I went to New York to have him polish the script, which he had written. He wrote the script. But uh, Milestone wanted a couple of adjustments made, but I guess in regard to where we were going to shoot. And uh, so I met him, and uh, ah. So in regard to working on the Red Pony, I have nothing to say except he sat there and worked with a pencil. But at one point during the war, I worked for the OWI, the Office of War Information. And we were doing a broadcast uh, with Frederick March and uh, Carson McCullers and John Steinbeck. And I was the uh, sort of announcer on the program. And in the course of sitting around and talking, Frederick March expressed his great admiration for Mark Twain. He was a great admirer of Mark Twain. This did not sit well with Steinbeck, who said, oh, so you're a Mark Twainiac, are you? <laughs> Jealousy. Any other questions? Yes, with a hat. Uh, within our community, there are lots of actors and actresses and lots of people who make movies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and several people are making a movie of you right now. In your opinion, is that a good thing, a bad thing, or none of the above? Wait, wait. I'm not sure what the question is. Is it a bad thing to make movies? We're all into making movies. It's a wonder. I think it's a wonderful thing. So you're saying is it too many people? No, it's just everybody's doing it. I think it's something. What do you think? You have hit upon a favorite subject of mine. Oh, hey. With which I will not bore you. However, given this opportunity, thank you, sir. <laughs> it is my feeling that with the technological improvement in all things regarding motion pictures, the cameras, the lenses, the film, or now it's not film, it's <laughs> DVD, etc. It has made it very easy for anyone to go into a store and buy a camera and start waving it around and they're directing a picture. For example, an indication of this is this handheld thing that goes on all the time, particularly in documentaries where you get dizzy sitting in your orchestra seat and the person has no idea of what a shot is. They are just going around picking everything. Also, even more skilled directors who want a shot, it now it's not enough to start on a couple of actors. You start on the scene is between two actors now. You start on the hill out there and you pick up that tree and you come along and you find this couple sitting here and then you go to the leaf. And after you get a close-up of the leaf, an insert, you come down, and finally you come to the actors who have the scene. You think I exaggerate? I am not going to mention the pictures I have in mind, because I, uh, it's a sensitive subject. But this gentleman's question is absolutely right. Uh, it made it too easy. In the old days, you had to work hard to get on a set. You were lucky if you get a job as a gopher. And then you ran around. Then you became a second assistant and then a first assistant. And it was years before maybe you became a first assistant. And then maybe you could get a chance to shoot something. No more. This was a business in the old days that the guys who came up were tough and they knew what it was and they spent years before they could direct. And uh, this is a result, I think, of the technological aspect. Also, there's been a great, uh, shall we say, decline in the c 
in the quality of writing, in what the pictures are about. And this is consonant with, in my view, the decline in our culture. But I will not bore you with any more of that. And then we have two, I think time for two more questions, unfortunately, after Harvey. And then hopefully Norman will stay a little bit and talk to people personally. But go ahead, Harvey. I'm fascinated by the fact that you hardly mentioned any women in any of this, uh, directors or actresses. I'm curious to know if you ever worked with Marion Davies. You won't believe this, but she was before my time. <laughs> uh, I met her once, socially, charming, lovely, charming person. She had a nephew who was a very successful motion picture writer named Charles Lederer. And he worked in the business. He was, had a great sense of humor. He was working on the remake of a Mut Mutiny in the Bounty and uh, they got they got to him a little late and someone asked him how he was doing he said oh, oh okay i'm only one day behind the camera <laughs> he was writing the script <laughs> so, <laughs> but i'm sorry to say i never knew her okay gentlemen over here where is that iconic uh farmhouse from walking the sun where is that located or where oh, was gosh. it located um we're going to show some scenes from a walk in the sun he wanted to know where the iconic farmhouse was and we believe it's down the hill, probably closer to Agoura, either like Morrison Ranch. But you'll see it in the clips. We're Unfortunately, we're waiting for the sun to go down, but around 8 o'clock, 8.15, we'll show the clips. You'll see, no, none of it's, nothing's left. Except the peaks. You'll, you'll recognize all the ridge lines because Mark Franklin of Franklin Video Productions stayed up till 4 in the morning cutting these clips together and did this as a volunteer. Wait till you see these clips, you won't believe it, and it's, you'll recognize everything. Okay, two more questions. Yes. Yes. Peter Weir and the Poet Society, how did uh, compare working with him Hitchcock? Talk about Peter Weir versus Hitchcock. How did it compare? Uh, there were two very, very different directors. I liken Peter Weir to another giant with whom I worked, and both, all, uh, both Chaplin and Orson Welles thought Jean Renoir was the number one man. And I compare Peter Weir to his way of working to Jean Renoir. It was with a thing about people that was magical with Jean Renoir. If you look today at Renoir's masterpiece, well, he, there were a couple, but the war picture Grand Illusion. It's magic. You don't know how he got that on the screen with these people. It's almost like there is no camera. And he had a fantastic eye. I'll tell you a great story about that. But it was what he did with his people and script. He was a very good writer, too. That was written with Jacques Prevert together. However, that was what he went, that was Renoir. Now, you, Peter Weir was like that. He was on when we made Dead Poets Society, remarkable with the people, and the way he kept shooting until he got what he wanted from the people. Now, Hitchcock, you see, Hitch had a great story to tell the Hitchcock story. It's become part of the literature now, not only of pictures, but you talk about a novel, it's a Hitchcock novel. Hitchcock had this mixture of irony, suspense, danger, wit, comedy, but as he once said, I hire actors, they should know their job. And we just stage it. Then I tell the story. 
Hitchcock was a remarkable storyteller. He gripped you right from the beginning. If you sat with him and you, uh, it, the conversation got around to what would be the next picture, he would tell it to you, and as he told it to you, you saw every frame of that picture. The man walked in the door, he sat down, he walked over, he did this, he picked up the cigar. He went, you saw every frame. That was his vision. And because he was so English, it came out with this peculiar English overtone. So he had this remarkable, extraordinary gift, which only the greatest had. He had a story to tell. Not the script, his story. Above all, Chaplin had it. The story of the immigrant was Chaplin. And Renoir was France. I mean, you look at his pictures and it's France. Uh, so, uh, the difference between Peter Weir and Hitchcock was actually in that content, the way they worked. Uh, Hitchcock, for example, <laughs> he did not like discussion too much about the characters. And there was a prominent actor who, for purposes of the story, should be nameless. Uh, it was making a picture with him, and Hitchcock said, this man was a star, a major star. And Hitchcock, at a certain point, directed him to sit. And the actor who was schooled in the method, the Stanislavski method, which deals deeply with the subjective, said, why do I sit in that chair? And Hitchcock said, to put your ass on the seat of the chair. <laughs> A more explicit direction I have never encountered. Last question, and, then, and Norman, you have, do you have a few minutes where you can stick around at the end to talk to people? Great, okay, last question, yes. Okay. Uh, what did you want to do when you were five and 15? Wow, what did you want to do when you were five years old and then when you were 15 years old? I can't remember. <laughs> Okay, that was a quickie. Maybe one last one. Go ahead. Right. You have an amazing recollection, but when you talk about yourself as an actor, where did you find full of some of those American and also foreign personalities that you portray? You brought so much of what seems to be like today, and I hear it now, and all of yourself. He was asking, where were you trained as an actor in your technique? Do you want to talk about Eva Le Gallien and Because as I look back over the 80 years, I was very lucky. Because I wandered about from thing to thing. And in the course of which I touched on many things. Uh, when I, as in my book, I start with saying, when I was a kid, five or six years old, seven years old, Jackie Coogan scored a big hit in a picture which Charlie Chaplin called The Kid, which has the greatest emotional scene I've ever seen in a picture. And the mothers of the land, of this country. This hit was so great that all the mothers took their five and six year olds and they decided they wanted them to be actors. There was another child actor named Wesley Barry. Same thing. So that happened to me. And I found myself being at the age of seven or eight going to take tap dancing lessons. Elocution. It was called elocution then. There weren't professional schools. You spoke elocution. Thus I was New York and not these does and dems, but close. And then um, 
got into amateur theatricals at 14, 15, and all that kind of thing in high school. Went to college, NYU, for two years. And in that time, this whole thing of wanting to be an actor. Now, it's my firm belief you cannot learn to be an actor. Your schools, to me, have no value whatsoever. It's an instinct, it's something you're born with, and you're lucky if you can hold on. But I do not believe that you can go to a teacher who will teach you how to act. It's an instinct. Now, I quit school because I wanted to act, and I auditioned at the Civic Repertory Theater, which was run by Eva Legallion, who was a major star in the American theater. But she started her own classical repertory company in New York City, down on 14th Street and 6th Avenue, in an old 19th century theater, big theater, well, not so big, about 700 seats. And there, this theater, Booth had played in this theater, Majeska had played in this theater, this was a really old, traditional theater. And she had a classical repertory company. So it's there that she wanted some apprentices to walk on. And so I auditioned to become an apprentice there. I was accepted. And there I learned speech and movement, but not how to act. These were important things that some of which have disappeared today. I defy you to understand some of these speaking in motion pictures today. Or if you're in the second row of a theater, I defy you to understand what they're talking about. <laughs> but speech to us was very important. And we did regu regular exercises and so forth. So that was it. I was on my way. Now, in the course of time, I did brush in with the group theater. And uh, because they were the foremost American theater, and to this day, the best theater we've ever had. And with them, they worked in the Stanislavski method. So I had my experience in that, and from everything, you can take something. And I took things from it, and for better or worse. And on we went. And that, I just went from job to job. It's the experience of acting. It's playing stock. It's going to work that you learn to act, not teaching. Norman, I want to thank you so much for coming in. Congratulations on your 80th year in show business. It's an amazing achievement. You do us great honor by coming here to Oak Park in Oak Canyon. Thank you.